this year marks the 30th anniversary of the Chernobyl disaster and the fifth anniversary of the Fukushima disaster. And there's been a kind of, the last month or so, there's been really kind of a convergence of, of great interest in this general topic. And, and, and of course, uh, especially when, there, when, when there's a topic where we know relatively little, and it's kind of surprising, it's been 30 years since Chernobyl, we still know relatively little about the health and environmental consequences of the disaster, it is kind of interesting that uh, there's, there's great debate, and this again stems from the fact that we know relatively little, or people claim that we know relatively little. Uh, the largest disaster, nuclear disaster in the history of the world was the Chernobyl disaster 30 years ago. Uh, contaminated very significant parts of northern Ukraine, about a third of Belarus, large expanses of, of, of southwestern Russia, but also what most people don't realize is that large parts of Central Europe, Austria, Germany, Northern Italy, and Scandinavia, and even parts of the UK were contaminated as a result of the Chernobyl disaster. In fact, the, the radionuclides were dispersed in the upper atmosphere around the planet, and you can actually, actually one of the problems right now with measurement of Japanese food products is that you can also detect the cesium signal from Chernobyl in some of these products. Uh, and so, uh, and in fact, you know, some of the import, imported mushrooms and berries and things like that still show up as being above regulatory limits from Eastern Europe. So this is an issue. Major, major impacts. Uh, Fukushima, on the other hand, uh, was about a tenth in terms of terrestrial impacts, about a tenth of Chernobyl, uh, plus or minus. We don't know what the total impacts to the marine side will be. We do know that there are ongoing inputs of radionuclides leaking into the ocean every every day, uh, and plus periodic major spills, especially when there's a typhoon that, typhoon that goes through. So these are all concerns that people have uh, related to these two events. My group has been, uh, you know, we started working in Chernobyl as kind of a hobby thing. Uh, I'm actually an evolutionary biologist, evolutionary geneticist. Uh, you know, I used to work on the genetic basis of sexual behavior in, in exotic insects, and uh, this was a, uh, uh, this is, was good stuff, but not, not particularly uh, widely read. But, uh, <laughs> you, know, you know, NSF, my, my funding agency, thought it was fine. They, they gave us lots of money to do it, and the work was always published. But, uh, but, you know, come on, you know, the genetics of sex in an insect, it's, you know, a little bit narrow focus. But uh, uh, we got started in Chernobyl just by accident about 16 years ago, and it started as a hobby. Uh, mainly an excuse to visit southern Spain once a year, where our control populations were. And, uh, and you know, we'd go for a week or two, study some birds, study some insects, write a paper or two to, to justify our time away. And, and that was really pretty much the extent of it for the first few years. But then we started to realize that, hey, something's going on here. Uh, they're, they're, they're actually strange anomalies in these populations. We were, we were interested in seeing how elevated mutation rates in natural populations would change the course of evolutionary response of these natural populations. And we were seeing rather strange things going on. And uh, anyway, we've been to Chernobyl uh, many times, Fukushima many times now, published a bunch of papers. And I did want to, again, I always point this out, just in case you get the wrong idea from what I talk about today, we're, we're not anti-nuclear activists. That's not our mission in life. We're, we're simply uh, evolutionary biologists looking for uh, discovery uh, uh, of new phenomena in the natural world. Um, but, but, you know, five years into our, into our sort of hobby program in Chernobyl, this report came out of the International Atomic Energy Agency's Chernobyl Forum. And this is, this is an expert group uh, appointed by different government organizations, usually um, uh, related to the nuclear field in some way. But they, in this, this expert forum, they claim to have reviewed the literature related to Chernobyl, and they came to the conclusion that, that and, and probably many of you in the audience have this same opinion, because it's one that's been perpetuated by, by the Disney Channel, among others, the, uh, the fact that oh, it looks like many of the animals are thriving inside the Chernobyl zone because there's a fence around it and there's no hunting. And, and by implication, uh, the suggestion by this report is that 
that uh, the radiation effects are, are minimal to none. Uh, and of course, one of the problems is they've also made similar suggestions with respect to human health issues. Uh, they've suggested that the vast majority of the stem from, from stress-related diseases related to the disaster. And there's no doubt that, that that's important as well, but they've used that to, to justify ignoring or not investing in proper research related to, to health effects as well. But this really gave us a boot in the pants in terms of uh, motivating us to, to go do some, some more rigorous studies. And, and let me just skip ahead. Uh, but anyway, 2006, you could make the claim that there wasn't a lot of research being done in Chernobyl up to that point, although I'll show you that there had been. 2013, two years after the Fukushima disaster, another committee, another United Nations committee, the UNSCAR committee, which is responsible for uh, mandating, reviewing the literature associated with radiation effects, they come out and say that we don't expect there to be any consequences for the biota, and I'm focusing on the biota here, uh, related to the disaster because the emissions, the deposition levels were just too low to be of any significant consequence based on our models of expected dose and response. And, uh, and, and again, we'd, at this point we'd published probably 50 papers on Chernobyl effects and, and maybe three or four on effects that we'd seen in Fukushima. So we were a little taken aback that the UNSCAR committee, again, committee of experts, uh, there may be even a member or two in the audience, I don't know, uh, <laughs> you know, the, uh, that they would ignore this literature. And, and you might ask, why would they ignore this literature? Um, and, and of course, the director general of the IEAE, the, the, the person responsible for promoting the peaceful use of the atom, uh, basically says the same thing, that there, we expect no effects and, and there's no literature to back up this claim. So that has kicked us in the pants as well to get going. Um, so, so what I'd like to do today, again, is just sort of review a few key examples, from, mostly from the work that we've been doing for the last few years, and, uh, and, then, and then hopefully bring it together at the end. Um, but before we go there, we have to do, since this is a public lecture, we need to do phys a little Physics 101 review. Just basically, if you're looking at biological systems, there are really two modes uh, of, of radiation effects that are of interest. There's probably more, but, but these are the two we're going to focus on today. And the first is that when, when you have uh, radioactivity in the environment emitting alpha, beta, or gamma rays, they have some probability of causing direct damage to the DNA by breaking the chromosomes, causing single or double strand breaks in the chromosomes. And, and so this is sort of a direct effect of radiation. Uh, if the radiation is ingested, it's more likely to have these effects, but, it, but external radiation can have the same effect. Another indirect effect of radiation, probably more important, I'll try to make the case that it is uh, in most of the results we've seen, uh, is the fact that by definition, this radiation is ionizing radiation. It has the ability to split water into to two ions, the uh, hydrogen and, the, and the, the peroxide, and that these molecules are very chemically active and they cause damage to biological systems, both direct, uh, direct damage to the DNA, but also damage to the proteins, DNA repair system, the membranes, basically many aspects of the, of the cellular system. Uh, and, and so these two, these two pathways are, are quite important. So 2006, 10 years ago, after the Chernobyl Forum report came out indicating that there were no consequences uh, uh, of, of the radiation in Chernobyl, we decided that that couldn't possibly be true, and so we did a literature review. You know, we start, everyone starts with a literature review, <laughs> and we did a sort of a crude analysis of the literature that existed up to that point, including the Eastern, Eastern European literature that had been largely ignored, put it all together, wrote this review for Trends in Ecology and Evolution, a fairly respectable journal. And, and you don't have to read this, but basically this is the list of studies dealing just with some measure of genetic damage. There were about 34 studies that we could find that had some estimate of genetic damage related to Chernobyl that was tested in some relatively rigorous way. Uh, 29 of those showed significant effects of, of radiation. I think four of those were germline. So damage, genetic damage that was pa inherited passed from one generation to the next. So at the time of the Chernobyl Forum report, there was lots of evidence of genetic damage, and, and this was not mentioned 
in, in the form report at all. We've since just upgraded this analysis in a more rigorous way. We've added 10 years worth of studies, uh, again, some of ours, some of other people's, and conducted a formal meta-analysis. And for those of you who are not in the business, the meta-analysis is, is it's, a, it's a technique that's becoming increasingly popular because it allows you to sort of mix and match all, you know, variable, <laughs> various data sets that were collected in slightly different ways, uh, but allows you to put it into a combined data set and to, and to test hypotheses in a relatively rigorous way using the combined data. This, this paper came out, I guess, about a year ago. And what this plot shows are the individual studies. About 150, we found about 151 test cases for some measure of genetic damage, either sequence level genetic damage or, or you know, deletions, insertions, or cytogenetic damage. Different, there are many different measures, but putting them all on the same scale, and th these are just each individual study. This is the zero line. These are 95% confidence intervals. And what you see is that the vast majority of these test cases show significant, large genetic damage associated with this radiation. Uh, the overall pattern is incredibly highly significant. There's no chance this arose by chance alone. Uh, there's a couple of cases down, down here that show some positive effect, but, but um, these seem probably just random. So I think that, you know, we, we, we pretty much nailed that door shut, I think. It, you know, there's no doubt that the levels of radioactivity that we see in Chernobyl, so-called low-dose radioactivity, have ser serious consequences for the, for the genetic systems. This is another recent result that, that attempts to tie together the mechanism, the potential mechanism of this genetic damage, whether it's direct or indirect. Uh, and, and so it's, it's a literature review, again, looking at Chernobyl studies and, and both, uh, both Eastern and Western literatures and extracting what we can find. And what, what the basic message from this paper is, and is, there's no real easy way to illustrate it graphically, um, the, it, but it, it's basically that individuals that suffer from oxidative stress show damage in relation to radiation exposure, whereas individuals that, show, that don't have oxidative stress, usually because they have high levels of antioxidants, don't show some kind of damage. So there's this trade-off between radiation exposure, antioxidants, oxidative stress, and, and injury, uh, and very highly significant relationships. Uh, and the moral of the story is that you should eat your blueberries. Uh, just make sure they're not from Ukraine. <laughs> because they, you know, the blueberry, the, one of the ironies is that you know, the blueberries are really good at capturing cesium, and they concentrate cesium. So if the blueberries are from Ukraine, uh, don't eat them. But, um, <laughs> and don't eat the mushrooms either, but that's another issue. So, so what does it matter? Do, does this genetic damage have any significance, really, uh, beyond just the genetic damage? And, and so to get at this, that's really been our major uh, contribution, uh, looking at what kinds of damage do you see and what levels of damage do you see? And I'm just going to run through a few examples for you. Um, so one of, the, one of the, the, the more interesting observations, we, we, we um, uh, both my partner in research, Anders Muller, and I were both really interested in behavior. We were both very interested in male-male competition and the evolution of, of sexual uh, roles and things like that, and so we started actually working with male gametes, sperm of the birds of male uh, male birds, and and uh, uh, Anders had actually uh, dug through the old literature and found a an old a very old technique for special massaging ter therapy for the extraction of fresh sperm from these male birds, and without hurting them, uh, and they, they'd actually calmly allowed themselves to be. Uh, manipulated in this way, and, and what we found using this fresh genetic material, which is a proxy for the inherited genetic damage, was that, in, for instance, in the barn swallows, in more radioactive areas, up to 40% of the sperm were morphologically damaged in some way, deformed, 
And there's, there's actually a whole taxonomy of sperm morphology damage because of all the interest with respect to human and animal breeding. And that was really interesting. And we found that the birds that showed the most damage to their sperm had the lowest levels of antioxidants in their blood and vice versa. So again, another hint towards the mechanism. And it's interesting that in, in just this, the, earlier this year, a group out of Oxford, England, have been marketing a special dietary supplement for men with infertility problems. What is it? What do you think? Yeah. It's an antioxidant supplement, yeah. It's really kind of, I thought that was really interesting. I wish I'd patented that one. A few years after the barn swallow studies, we, we actually gathered up about 500 males from a variety of different species uh, and started looking at their sperm as well. And the basic message was that in the more radioactive areas, up to 40% of the birds in a given year were, 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 were completely sterile. They had no sperm or just a few dead sperm. We thought this was interesting because, of, you know, of course, it's, it's, a frequent, it's a frequent outcome of radiation therapy for male, with males with prostate cancer uh, to be temporarily or permanently sterile. So it's not new knowledge, it's not anything new. Uh, it's just had never been observed in the Chernobyl setting. Uh, but clearly, if you're sterile, you're not going to be contributing to the gene pool of the next generation. Another character that is, you know, has been widely known to be indicative of radiation exposure are early onset uh, cataracts in the eye. You know, everyone who lives long enough is going to get cataracts, but it's pretty unusual to see cataracts in the eyes of children. And uh, it was really first noticed in some of the children born to women who were pregnant at the time of the atomic bombs in Japan. And uh, this is a little poster from Hiroshima, the museum in Hiroshima, talking about it. And so we thought, uh, we should look at some of our wild animals living in low-dose environments in Chernobyl. And, and lo and behold, uh, the, when we looked at the birds, uh, several hundred of them, uh, again, uh, the frequency and intensity of the cataracts were, was much higher in the areas of high radi background radiation. And, uh, and again, it, the, you can actually uh, take photos of them, although it, it's, it really it turns out that ophthalmology is kind of an art form. I hadn't realized just how much it was. But uh, the... Uh, if you spend a lot of time, you can actually get a few photos, but mostly it's a subjective scaling. We've since added rodents to our repertoire in both Chernobyl and Fukushima and found the same thing in the rodents. Much higher frequency of cataracts uh, and, and, and severity of cataracts. And they're of the type that we associate with radiation exposure uh, being on the posterior part of the lens. And they reflect it's well known that, that these, this kind of cataract is associated with oxidative stress. Uh, and so radiation-induced oxidative stress in this case. Another frequently, frequent observation from the atomic bomb survivors was, was uh, uh, cognitive problems and, and, and smaller head sizes, smaller brain sizes, uh, again, for children who were in utero at the time. and, and uh, uh, and what's, of course, interesting is that uh, there, was, there, there had been a few case studies in the medical literature of, from women who had, had gone for either x-ray treatment in the 1920s and 30s, who went in for x-ray treatment or radium treatment for cervical cancer. At the time, they, they really had no way to tell uh, you know, if a woman was really pregnant I guess. Uh, they didn't have ultrasound at the time. And so there were a number of cases where children were born to these women who had had treatment who had, again, serious mental retardation problems and smaller, smaller head sizes, often extremely small microencephaly uh, kind of conditions. So we looked at our birds and, you know, much, again, this really surprised us, but the, you know, the brain size uh, of these birds was, on average, 5% lower in the more, con more contaminated areas. And that may not sound like a lot, but, you know, we're talking about birds, so, you know, 5% is, you know, significant. And we know it's significant because the birds with the smaller brains, the smallest brains, had half the chance of surviving from one year to the next, implying that there were cognitive 
consequences of this reduced brain size. Uh, and um, we've also now uh, looked at it uh, for the rodents in both Chernobyl and Fukushima and found the same general pattern of reduction. And, and, and again, it's not really surprising. It's known from the medical literature that neurological tissues development is very susceptible to, very vulnerable to oxidative stress. And so the, um, the, the, this kind of phenomenon has, is, has been reported repeatedly, again, just not for any kind of natural radioactive situation in natural wild populations. But, you know, what's the first thing, you know, anybody thinks of when you start talking about radiation? It's cancers, right? You know, that's, the, that's what we all sort of jump to. And, and so uh, we thought we'd better look for cancers in our, in our critters as well. And, and, and again, uh, it took us a few years to, to, to capture <laughs> enough birds and rodents to, to, to do the statistical analysis that's necessary to do this rigorously. And, uh, uh, but when we had, uh, again, it, very, very clear that, uh, again, much higher frequencies of, of, of these kinds of developmental anomalies, uh, tumors and various other growths that are uh, just not seen in most natural populations. Uh, so here's an example. Uh, this is, I, I tell my students I'm going to Ukraine to study great tits and they think it's funny. I don't know why. Uh, but uh, the great tit is, you know, a common species uh, in Europe. Uh, pretty, pretty ornery uh, little beast, tough as nails. They actually do relatively well, and they're one of the species that actually doesn't show much of a, an effect of radiation, but they do have an increased rate of these kinds of tumors. Here's one around the eye. Uh, we tend to see them frequently on the head. Here's a nightingale with one on top of its head. Uh, here's another one on its wing. That one's kind of obvious, nasty looking thing. Um, and, and again, just a, a, a variety of different developmental malformations that you don't see in most natural populations. Um, and I, I, was, I gave a lecture today at uh, Cal State San, San Marco uh, and asked the students, uh, you know, so why is it that we don't see these kinds of anomalies in, in nature very often? Any thoughts? Because they die. Because they die. Uh, yeah, absolutely. You know, if you had one of these growth forms, you, you, you're very likely not to, you know, you're very likely to be picked off by a predator. Uh, or not find food, or certainly you're not going to find a mate. Um, so, so the fact that we see these things at such, you know, at, at two, three percent of the population is really uh, astounding. And, and uh, the suggestion is that they're probably occurring at a much higher level and just disappearing before we get to see them. And I could give you more anecdotes of that sort at another time. So, so anyway, I, I, I hope, you know, isn't it? Isn't it surprising to you that the International Atomic Energy Agency had not done any of these kinds of studies in Chernobyl before the last 10 years? I, I, I don't know. I was kind of flabbergasted uh, because it's not rocket science, let's face it. It's pretty descriptive natural history kind of studies and it just took somebody out there catching birds and looking at them or mice or insects uh, and they just didn't do it. Uh, so it makes you kind of wonder. But the, 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 the one question I really wanted to get to today uh, was this issue that, that I'm sure you, you know, any of you who followed Chernobyl in the news uh, or watched any of the TV programs on Chernobyl, you've seen some reference to how the animals are thriving, right? This is, uh, the, the, you know, there's a fence around it, there's no hunting, so the animals have taken off. And, uh, and, and the, the media people just can't help themselves. They, they're just drawn to that Cinderella story so much. So despite the fact that you know, we've published 20 plus papers specifically on that question, uh, you know, one paper comes out that suggests that maybe they're thriving in the zone and you know, they get <laughs> you know, written up all over the place uh, in every TV program. And it's really, like, you know, everybody likes a positive message, I know. So how, you know, how do you get at this question in a rigorous way, uh, rather than just sort of anecdotal reports? You know, I went to Chernobyl, I saw a moose, everything must be fine. That's really been largely the extent of these kinds of reports. Uh, so how do you get at this question in a convincing, statistically robust, rigorous manner? And so 
It turns out that Chernobyl and Fukushima, to a lesser extent, provide the ideal opportunity for highly replicated comparisons of radioactive and unradioactive or non-radioactive areas that, that, that are about the same kind of habitat all over the landscape. This isn't the best map to show this, but, but basically I uh, wanted to you know, make the point that, that the radioactivity is highly patchy. Some areas are really radioactive and then half a mile away it's relatively clean and it's dispersed across the, the landscape. And in fact, you have these areas over here in Belarus and Russia uh, where uh, you have the same kind of patchwork, but they're you know, 150 miles away. So really kind of an independent spot. And so what we've done uh, to get at this question, and also to address the issue that no one was looking at these critters before the accident. So you really don't know what the baseline is. So you have to come up with a model to infer what the baseline is. Um, the way we've done it is to go to hundreds of locations, uh, about, about 300 in locations in, in Chernobyl scattered across Ukraine and Belarus. Uh, we tried to go to Russia, but they put us in jail. So 300 locations surveyed three times in the late 70s, or 2000s, I mean. And in Fukushima, we've been tracking the, the birds and insects since July of 2011 at 400 locations, again, scattered across hot and cold areas in the, in the region. Uh, and, uh, and, and we use, you know, some of you in the room, I'm sure, are familiar with multivariate statistics uh, and the use of GIS, uh, but basically we do this highly replicated, massively replicated biotic inventory. And that, and that just means we, we make a list of every species we see, mostly birds and insects, uh, at each of these 400 locations. We've done it four times now for four different years. And we, we count the numbers of each species as well. But we also record all of the other environmental variables that might be important for determining whether or not an individual species is there, is there water, what's the soil type, what kind of vegetation, is it close to a road, what time of day is it, what's the weather like, all of those kinds of things, plus measures of, of radiation uh, and, and some kind of, inf sometimes we reconstruct the dose to the individual species, uh, some GIS, geographic information system, and our, our multivariate statistics to basically look at the partial effects of radiation while removing all of these other environmental factors across the landscape. And that's why you need so many of these, these, these points. When you do that and you publish all these papers, uh, and that's just to show you that I'm not, I'm, that, I, that, that, that it's real. <laughs> this was uh, the first result, it's a little crude, from Chernobyl basically. If you go to areas of high radiation levels, there are many fewer individuals, approximately a third. Uh, compared to the relatively clean areas. And this is not related to distance from the reactor. This is independent of distance. This is factoring out the other environmental factors. This is the radiation effect. If you look at biodiversity or species richness, you're much more likely to see you know, multiple species at a given point. Each one of these dots represents a given biotic inventory. Uh, you're much more likely to see multiple species at a given spot in the relatively uncontaminated areas as compared to the clean areas. And, you know, basically we've done this for all of the major groups that, that are possible to do. Uh, it, for the mammals, we've actually taken a slightly different approach. We've looked at, we've used tracking in the snow. So we've gone to Ukraine and waited for a fresh snowfall and then gone out and tracked the animals, surveyed, run transects to, to count the numbers. There's not so many different kinds of mammals that you can't do it from their footprints. And again, all of the critters except the wolf show negative, as groups show negative uh, responses, have lower densities in the more radioactive areas uh, 25 years plus after the disaster. What about Fukushima? So the first year in Fukushima, we found that a few of the species of birds showed marked drop-offs in the areas of high contamination, as did butterflies and the cicadas. And, but the spiders actually increased in, in the more radioactive areas. And, and you know, it's kind of, kind of bizarre. We, we think it's because, uh, well, any ideas? Why would spiders go up in, a, in an area? Eat the dead insects? Well, maybe, maybe the insects are easier to catch. That, that's one thought we had, and, and certainly... Fewer predators. Fewer predators, oh, thank you very much. Uh, you're not a plant. 
but uh, fewer pre we think it's because there are fewer birds. That's one hypothesis. But anyway, these, each data point here represents a corrected uh, abundance at a given point in space and time. And again, ex you know, highly, highly significant drop-offs in, in numbers in the more radioactive areas. Uh, and if we look at species richness, the number of species, again, you're much less likely to find more than one or two species in these high radi radioactive areas. And uh, I don't know, let's see if the video will work. And I, I, you, know, you know what they say about a picture being worth a thousand words. Uh, a video is worth a thousand pictures, um, especially if it's got audio. Let's see if it works. Uh-oh. Okay, let's try again. PC, work. <laughs> Well, it's not going to work. The, uh, uh, the bottom, the, what it was supposed to show you is that there are uh, lots of birds singing here and sort of typical. And up the road, just 10 miles in a much more radioactive area, it's almost dead silence. And, and it's really overwhelming. If you're a birder, any birders in the audience? You know, if you're a birder, it's, it's really, really obvious um, that the numbers are down. So. Yeah. So birds fly, so 10 miles away, uh, and you're talking about population and over generations, and is it, why are there 10 miles away, there are birds singing, and none over there? The, the, the birds that are singing don't even go over there anymore? Go to the other places? No, they, they, they do go. Um, and they're So, so it's, it, you know, it's hard to, to say exactly what's going on. Clearly, their survival is, their survival and reproduction of, the survival and reproduction of many species is lower in these more radioactive areas, but there is still immigration coming in. So in, in Chernobyl, where we've done a lot more work than Japan, we know, in fact, for instance, for the barn swallows, uh, based on stable isotope analysis of museum specimens versus contemporary specimens, that these populations in the more radioactive areas of Chernobyl are actually only being sustained as a result of constant immigration from adjacent areas. Uh, we can see it in the fingerprint, the, 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 the stable isotope ratios tell you, you know, that they were born in different places when you look at an individual, so you know that they came in from adjacent uh, populations. And uh, so we think that, the, that these are black holes from a population standpoint, and, and if there weren't immigration, they would actually go locally extinct for the most part. But there's always, you know, natural populations are dynamic. There's, it's the balance of birth, deaths, immigration, and emigration that determines how many critters are actually in a given spot. Uh, here in Fukushima, we've gotten a little bit older, and, you know, we've been slapped around a little bit over the years, and so we decided to be more rigorous in our radiation, the radiation part of the equation, the dosimetry part. And so we actually teamed up with a group in France to reconstruct the doses to the 7,000 individual birds that we had been counting over the, over the previous four years to look at a real dose response relationship in a, in a way that, that the toxicologists and the, and the radioecologists could, could hopefully appreciate. And, and basically, uh, again, it looks like this. Uh, and, 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 this is what I, the main point here is that this is a relatively straight line. This is a straight line with relatively small confidence intervals. It's a nice declining line, uh, again with with population sizes dropping with increased predicted dose to these individuals, uh, and and you know the, the basic line. The best fit to this this relationship is a is a uh, log log linear kind of relationship. So it's. Uh, there's no evidence of any kind of threshold in the data. It's, it's uh, fairly, um, fairly clear that there's this negative impact, no matter how you look at it, and that radiation is the most likely cause. The fact that we have replicated the same findings in both Chernobyl and in Fukushima, two completely independent spots that uh, you know, have not been, uh, they're not linked at all, uh, again, that's the strongest evidence for the importance of the radiation. We've got genetic effects, we've got injuries to individuals, we've got population effects, we've got community effects. You know, as an ecologist, you know, the next level is this ecosystem level effect, right? 
And we looked at it in a number of different ways, but one of the most fundamental processes we've tried to look at, at least in a cursory manner, is this issue of uh, nutrient cycling in, in, in an ecosystem. Uh, and, and what got us going on this topic was, an, again, an anecdotal observation during one of our early visits. In this case, this was 2002. <clears throat> We're walking through the so-called Red Forest at Chernobyl. This is this vast expanse of pine forest that was killed relatively quickly uh, within weeks of the disaster, or it was killed right away, but the trees turned red within a few weeks of the disaster, hence the name Red Forest. And again, thousands of acres that were killed off in this way. The trees, some of the trees were bulldozed into piles and buried because they were so radioactive, but a number of them were just left there to stand and, and, and eventually they fall over. And 15 years, 16 years after the disaster, we're walking through here and look at these trees. They're, 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 it was really noticeable. They're, they were hard. You know, you'd kick them and they were solid. And, and this was striking to me because all the places I've lived at and have lived in my life, uh, apart from Death Valley, where I didn't actually live there, but uh, you know th these trees would be sawdust within three years in my backyard in South Carolina. So this was kind of a, uh, a striking thing, <clears throat> and, um, and and we noticed that the again anecdotally that the litter, the leaf litter, uh, from you know had was seemed to be thicker. You know there seemed to be more of a cushion in these areas of high radioactivity, and it sort of you know the light bulb went on suggesting that maybe nutrient cycling, microbial activity, uh, might be affected. And so we actually set up an experiment and wrote a paper or two. And, uh, and this is just to show the students that I actually do do the real field work. Uh, and these are the sort of bags we put out, uh, 600 of them with various kinds of clean, uncontaminated leaf material put them out in, across the zone at uh, areas of high and low radioactivity, and measured everything we needed to know about the soil and humidity and other important factors, and came back a year later and weighed these bags and found that the rate of decomposition was reduced by about 50% in the more radioactive areas. And so these are averages for, for different transects lines, but basically very, very strong signal of radiation effect on, on, on the decomposition rate. And, and so again, why is this important? Well, a couple of reasons. You know, one is nutrient cycling is you know, a major driver of primary productivity and you know, what makes things grow. If you don't have the, the dead plant material decomposing, uh, it's going to be a depauperate, nutrient depauperate kind of environment. Uh, so that's, that's really critical, and we do actually see a signal of reduced tree growth rates of the pine trees in these more radioactive areas. Initially, we thought it was the direct effects of radiation, but I'm thinking more and more it might be this effect that's, that's driving tree growth variability. But potentially more important, and this should be a topic of interest to some of you, uh, we felt that, that one of the big issues was the fact that this represented a huge hazard should there be forest fires in the area. Because all of this leaf litter, all this rotting plant material was highly radioactive. And so if it caught fire, and we knew that there were fires from time to time, if it caught fire, particularly if it was a large intense fire, there was the possibility of redistribu redistributing these radionuclides to other inhabited parts of Europe. And so we wrote a paper for ecological monographs last, came out last spring, and, and, and lo and behold, and where we predicted that there could be significant consequences, especially for the firefighters, but also for people living downwind. Uh, and, and of course, there were three major forest fires in Chernobyl last year, uh, covered in the news. Uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, two of them were in areas that were relatively clean, probably started by, you know, people throwing cigarette butts out the window, the usual way. But uh, one of them was in an area of fairly high contamination. And so we just, this, this paper actually just came out uh, a couple of days ago, uh, maybe yesterday. And basically where we, we've actually modeled how much of this radioactivity was released from the fire, forest fires this past year. Uh, and and the, the short answer is that it, it, it wasn't a significant risk for people living in Germany or Scandinavia, but the people living in Belarus, you know, 100 miles away, 
ex probably experienced a, you know, maybe a 30% increase in their annual dose as a result of these forest fires. So, you know, again, if this happens year after year, that, that's potentially significant in terms of a health risk. Um, so, oh, and this is just to show, uh, you can see, this was another anecdote that uh, um, related to the tree growth. But we first realized that the trees were affected uh, when, one winter when we were doing the mammal surveys. We were stuck behind a group of foresters who were cutting fire breaks and uh, they were stacking all these trees up along the roadside and I looked over at this pile of trees and see this color change here? And you notice how it's, it's at about the same width in the outer layer and you know whether the tree was old or young, large or small and, and, and and I, you know, the light bulb went off again, so I jumped out of the car. And because they're pine trees, they're really easy to count the rings. And sure enough, the, this, this change in color, change in wood density, actually uh, all occurred at about the time of the Chernobyl event. And so we subsequently cored all of these trees and analyzed the cores and, and found that growth rates were significantly uh, lower, uh, especially in the first five years after the disaster. But Getting, going right back to the beginning, uh, you know, the whole reason we went started going to Chernobyl again wasn't just because it justified a week in southern Spain, but it it also uh, we thought provided an opportunity to to look for an, a novel, potentially novel kind of adaptation to this novel kind of environmental perturbation, and you know rate, increased mutagen, mutagenic environment, and and. Uh, and so uh, we asked the question this year for the 30th anniversary uh, whether or not anyone has shown any level of adaptation to this environment. And you know, originally we thought we would see maternal effects evolving, you know, mothers allocating more antioxidants to eggs and stuff like that. But the bottom line is there there've only been maybe 17 studies that we could find that that even attempted to address this question and only one of the 17 showed any evidence of anything approaching uh, adaptive uh, responses to, 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 the, uh, to the radioactivity. Um, turns out that, and, and you know, we've done a couple of studies on the, for instance, this is one just came out today or last week on fungus, where we actually sequenced the entire genome of, of the parasitic fungus that parasites different kinds of plants. And it was kind of interesting because we showed no, we found no evidence of increased mutation rates in, in these genomes. What we did find, though, is selection against some of the genetic variability. So it re represented some kind of truncation selection or purifying selection, but no evidence of adaptation. Uh, and this is another paper that uh, has come out recently showing that in bacteria, again, uh, looking at bacteria collected from different levels of radioactivity, bringing them into the lab and then zapping them with radiation, uh, basically finding that Again, all of the bacteria from all of the sites respond negatively to radiation in terms of growth rates in the lab. Although one of the one of the one of the populations isolates from one of the populations uh, seem to do relatively better relative to the other population sources, but still very negatively with respect to radiation. So again, no evidence of any kind of real evolution or adaptive evolution, uh, even for the bacteria. So, bottom line, those government reports that we all read and cite all the time, well, you know, look at who the authors are. Uh, it seems that, uh, it seems like there are opportunities under some circumstances for these reports to not be an accurate reflection of the literature. Uh, I think there are a number of different reasons for that. Uh, I, think, I think the International Atomic Energy Agency is a little bit different than some of the other United Nations agencies, uh, you know, it was brought up earlier today that the you know the IPCC has done a great job at characterizing the issues related to climate change. Uh, that was a collection of thousands of scientists from all kinds of institutions, uh, working collectively in a relatively democratic way. The Chernobyl Forum and UNSCAR don't work that way. They are appointees from governments, from nuclear regulatory agencies, uh, and they they seem to be. Uh, missing, uh, deliberately uh, ignoring a large part of the literature. Uh, but we have found over and over again many examples, not just us, that clearly these low dose rates when, it, when the, the organisms are exposed chronically over multiple generations 
show consequences. It's been shown that animals living in the wild, organisms living in the wild are considerably more susceptible to this kind of chronic dose uh, exposure than, than animals living in the lab. Uh, again, for the affectionados in, 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 the, in the room, all of the relationships that we've looked at show something like a proportional increase, but no threshold below which there's no effect. So a little radiation has a small effect, a lot of radiation has a big effect, and, and really no strong evidence of adaptation. And um, let me just skip ahead and say, you know, ask the question, why should we care? You know, Chernobyl was kind of unique, three mile, as, as you mentioned, you know, Three Mile Island, still debated. You know, where's all the data from Three Mile Island? You know, where, what are all the studies from Three Mile Island? Where, where are they? But uh, Chernobyl was a unique event, kind of associated with former Soviet Union and their, their, their management style, their technology. Fukushima was a natural disaster. Turns out, if you know, some folks think that there's a very high probability of another accident uh, on a Chernobyl scale uh, in, by 2050, maybe a Fukushima scale in, in much less time, uh, based on a, an analysis of, of accidents and incidents. So that's one reason. Another, another reason for being interested, uh, again, there have been a lot of discussion, especially after the, the issues in Belgium, uh, the terrorist attacks in Belgium, uh, a lot of interest, a lot of concern for uh, the potential for both nuclear and, 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 and uh, dirty bomb kinds of events. So these, those are reasons for being interested. But what, what's the main reason we should be interested in radiation consequences? Anybody have any thoughts beyond these environmental things? So, so it turns out the, the, the main source of increasing radiation in our personal environments comes from medical sources. Uh, how many of you in this room have had a CAT scan? Yeah, so, you know, CAT scan, uh, you know, the, the typical CAT scan gives a dose of about six millisieverts, uh, plus or minus. They're trying to get it down, uh, but but it's that, that's about twice your normal annual dose. And so it tur turns out that these low doses from medical sources are rising dramatically in the Western world in particular. So, so again, there's a lot we can learn that might be of relevance to, to, to us in our everyday lives uh, by studying the birds and the bees. And with that, I will stop and, and just mention, of course, that uh, None of this uh, could, be, uh, could have been done without the help of a large number of people in, in many different continents, uh, and, uh, and, and, and I'm very grateful to them. And thank you all for coming out tonight. Well, and thank you for your enthusiasm. <laughs> That's great.